Hello ladies and gentlemen, it's Mike here at Game From Scratch, and the wait for Godot is over. Well, at least the wait for Godot 4.3, because it just released. Now this is uh, a pretty big release, we're going to jump in with some hands-on functionality, and then we'll get back to the release notes, which have gotten a major facelift. Kudos to the Godot team on upping their release notes game. First, we're going to do a quick demonstration, first in 3D, and then in 2D, uh, some of the new functionality. In 3D first, so here we've got a brand new 3D scene, and what I'm going to do is head on over here, and you'll notice I have this FBX file. I'm going to drop that into my scene, and now it is importing it in the background. So this is um, not the most exciting thing to watch, but boom, what you just saw, brand new import of our assets. We could go ahead and see that the FBX should be available here, and boom, you can drop it into the scene. So why is this exciting? Well, first off, it's because I actually have not installed the FBX importer. There is a new FBX importer called UFBX, which is available by default. So no more need to install the FBX to GLTF importer. Uh, you can, by the way, if you wish, and you can switch between which one you wish to use, but there is this new universal importer here for FBX files included out of the box. This is a lovely new feature. Now, another thing you're gonna notice about it is if I go ahead and select this asset over here, and we go to the import tab, we can go to the advanced section, and there are some updates to how the imports work work. Uh, and the specifically, the, we had some improvements in the last one, we now have these nice previews. So for example, here you could come in and you can see your animations and how they work. This was actually added in Godot 4.2. This process does keep getting better. But the other thing you'll notice here is I could come over here and now under the skeleton that's created, we have a bunch of new features here. You can check the, the default pose to use for when something's brought in. But more importantly, you can actually create a new bone mapping here. So if you want to do remapping of the bones of your skeleton when when you import objects, you now can do this. By the way, this is not tied to UFBX. This is just the um, import process in general. So it doesn't matter which importer you actually use. By the way, you can also set here in the import settings, which one to use. So if you have the FBX to GLTF enabled, you could switch and import right there. So you could use whichever one works better for you. FBX is such a key interchange format for uh, 3D file interchange. This is actually from Mixamo, for example, a very common thing to work with. So having improvements to FBX is is always nice. We also got a lot of improvements in the world of 3D. So let's go ahead and create a new scene here. Uh, this is going to be a 2D scene this time. And we'll just go ahead and demonstrate. I'm going to need a couple more assets for this one. So let's go back over to my demo assets and we will grab all of these and import them in. Now nothing changed on the importing side of things here. Uh, so we have a typical world. So let's say here I'm going to go ahead and bring in my background image here. So BG here. So there is a standard background thing going on here. And one of the things I'm gonna demonstrate that is new, so we're gonna know 2D over here, is this, tile maps. So tile maps were completely re-architected. Before it used to have a tile map and then a set of layers underneath them. Now they're actually all implemented as tile map layers. Simple as that, create a new tile map over here. So get here, create a new tile set. Uh, these are, um, 48 by 48 in dimensions, I believe. Uh, create our tile set over here. So that's one of the things I just brought in. So you're gonna notice over here, I have this tile set and we'll automatically generate them. Uh, and then what I'm gonna do is actually create another layer using a different tile set. So once again, tile map layer, go over here and we will create our new tile set. So these tile sets are now inherited from the node TD hierarchy instead of being canvas layers. And it gives you a number of different options in how they work. So we've got here, we've created it. Let's go over here. We'll set our other tile map on that one. Uh, and that will be this guy over here. So tile maps are often used in creating typical um, 2D worlds using recyclable pieces. So here we say uh, this one might be tile map layer background and we'll call this one foreground. By the way, their hierarchy is important for these ones will be drawn on top of these ones. So background here, let's go ahead, simple tile map drawing here. So switch over to tile map settings, pick our dirt here, and we can just go ahead and draw our tile map. So you've got tools like this. You've also got things like flood fill. So if you've got a selection of areas, you can draw it that way. So that is how you would do a typical tile map layer. So now we've got our other tile map here, and it's going to go ahead and we're just going to drop some trees into our world, like this selection over here. Uh, so tile map, and we're not going to paint with that one, so we're going to draw with that one, and we can do some trees. 
like this. So you see how they all kind of interact together? Well, this new setup allows you to do a lot of specific effects directly on the layers, and it makes things more clean and streamlined in how they work. Now, the problem is you used to have a tile map layer as a top level thing, and you could navigate through all your child layers of tiles below them. That has been removed because each individual layer is now its own object. See here, we can get rid of it completely. They're all completely separate objects, but they have faked it to a certain degree. So if you want to navigate between your tiles, you see you have these selections right here. So you can move between them this way, and you can do a selection of all of them that way. So uh, they've changed the, the navigation between them, the way that tile map layers work all together. Uh, so complete re-architecting of how tile maps work. I do find the new system to be much more intuitive uh, over the old system. Now another area that changed here is the parallax layers. So we now have a uh, parallax layer available right here. So it's parallax 2D I'm going to use in this demonstration. All right, so, so we got a parallax background. And parallax backgrounds are often used so it's, you got something behind the scene that you uh, wish to move at a different speed. Uh, so for example, clouds. So go here. Let's add some clouds into our scene like so, and then put them as part of our parallax 2D. Now, once again, the order of everything is important. So let's put these in front of the background, but behind our tile map. So you can see the results of it right there. So that is the new uh, way that parallax layers are set up. So there's been a bunch of changes how they can do uh, repetition, etc. between the parallax are easier to work with. And they're also now inherited from Node 2D, which should be making with them and the effects that you can do with them much nicer to work with. So you see here, I could move my clouds. So there you see my clouds moving in the background here. And obviously you could do multiple parallax layers. Another neat thing that we've got built in here is though the way you used to do it before is parallax background. So you used to use this class right here, which was inherited from canvas layer. Well, let's say you have a parallax background like this, and we're going to go ahead and we'll set our parallax trees. So there we go. Now we're going to put those as part of our parallax background. Well, this isn't going to work out all that great uh, because this is the old way and not the new way. So we got the old way in here, right? So, so you notice here with the um, parallax background selected though, I now have this option right here. And what I can do is say, okay, convert this to a parallax 2D setup. So if you want to go from the old parallax background to the new parallax uh, 2D setup, Boom, just click the button there, and then you're going to see immediately it works. So we've got our different parallax backgrounds here. So we put that there, or the foreground, so like over here. Or we can have the clouds in front, which I think actually makes more sense. Oh, wait, no, clouds would be in front by this way, and so on. So you've got your uh, multiple different layers available here. Uh, it's just a nice new setup. So if you're working with parallax backgrounds, different levels of parallax backgrounds, and you're using the old system, there is that new conversion process in place, which makes it all very nice to work with. All right, so that's it for the hands-on portion of this demo. So here we are now in the release notes. I told you earlier on, they really did an improvement to their release note game, as you're going to see right here. So we've got a lot of things in the 4.3 release. Uh, there were 3,487 commits, uh, as well as 518 contributors. So there's more people contributing to uh, Godot than ever before, and there's more improvements in this release than there were in the past. So let's go jump in and take a look at what is new here. So we've got some improvements to audio. You now have interactive music. This is implementing via three new resources, audio streaming, interactive, stream playlist, and synchronize. So if you want to have, say, like dynamic soundtracks, uh, you can do that. You can layer your music, have better transitions, that kind of thing. We also have some improvements to the physics system in that we now have 2D physics interpolation. You can see the results between the two. This can be used to remove some of the jitter you get between the physics engine updating and the rendering side of actually drawing it. It should just basically make it look better on a display that has a high refresh rate uh, and other scenarios there. We've also got uh, some overall visual shader editor improvements there. So uh, Visual Shader has been revamped from the ground up to be more visually appealing and to enhance the readability of large complex shader graphs. Nodes are now color based on their category and the colors of connection have been adjusted to be easier on the eye. Clicking on a node now highlights it for better visibility. Two new node types have been added, a reroute node and a frame node. So for better um, organizing how your shaders all work together. Nice improvements across the board if you are using visual shaders there. Uh, layers also, we saw this earlier on. Uh, the tile map now has switched to the new tile map layer support. Um, and it, it's you can actually convert tile maps uh, to tile map layers, kind of the same process we saw with the parallax background conversions. Uh, 
earlier on. Another thing that they've done, this is sort of a Back to the Future thing, uh, in Godot 3, you had a single and multi-threaded web exports. With 4, they assumed the browser technology would improve, that would allow them to have multi-threading on that. Unfortunately, that did not end up being the case, so they have moved it back for better compatibility to single-threaded exports on uh, web exporting. Uh, also, uh, multi-threaded improvements in general uh, across the board. And the 2D side of things, again, we have the tile map improvements we talked about earlier on. Also, the new changes to the Parallax 2D node with the conversion tool that is in place. So Parallax, again, is that layering of backgrounds on top of each other. Uh, so the old system, you couldn't do a lot of effects with it. Certain things are now possible that weren't before. There is a full breakdown of what is new in the Parallax system. Just know that you've got a bunch of options you didn't before. And the node hierarchy is a bit clear cleaner than it used to be. Uh, in terms of, uh, we have pixel art stability improvements as well. So if you're doing uh, you know, chunky pixel stuff, you're gonna see the results of it right here, the stability of moving, some of the jitter that you're not getting when you move things around. So you definitely see the results of those improvements there. Uh, we have improvements to the animation. First off, I mentioned earlier on, the uh, FBX importer, or just the importers in general, so GLTF, XBX, etc. now have that new retargeting options in place and the uh, pose options there. So if you want to retarget your animations, well, bringing them in, create your own, reset your own poses, etc. You now have that option there. On top of that, on the programming side of things, Animation Mixer has new options via the Skeleton Modifier 3D node. It gives you a bunch of things that you can do uh, using script that you couldn't do with animations before. And uh, you can enable keyframe manipulations so you can finally select, copy, paste, and duplicate keyframes. Uh, on the C-sharp side of things, a number of improvements there. So script reloading process was improved. Uh, new C-sharp bindings to get rebuild notifications. So the inspector of your nodes and resources containing C-sharp scripts will now display a warning whenever you've made changes in your code, but not rebuilt the project yet. Now this makes a lot of sense because a lot of people will be working in Visual Studio Code or Writer or something to that effect instead of directly in the editor. So you're gonna get better um, notifications of that. Uh, also generic support is now supported out of the box. Generics are obviously very important in the world of C-sharp. Definitely a nice improvement there. And preventing exports while missing uh, with missing C sharp files has been implemented as well. Now we've got two on the display side of things. Unfortunately, I can't really demonstrate either of these to you. Number one, Direct3D 12 rendering support is now available, but you do have to do your own build on that one. And then the other one, I can't demonstrate because I'm not using Linux, but Linux finally has Wayland support. Now this is an alternative to X11 windowing system. Um, and this, is, this was a feature first requested back in 2014. So a decade later, it is now available. Now Wayland has been an evolving thing in the world of Linux installs in general, but if you wish to use the Wayland system instead of the X11 protocol, that option is now available uh, in Godot. Uh, also have some improvements to uh, the documentation. Uh, including obviously these new release notes that we're seeing right now. Again, they look much better. Uh, also have um, in-editor documentation updates. So uh, part of the online and always up-to-date Godot docs are available directly in your editor as an offline copy. Note that its contents are tied to the Godot engine version you are using and are limited to the class reference section. We gave that documentation copy a needed facelift and now has syntax highlighting uh, to improve quality of life even further to re um, reproduce the copy button from its online pendant. You can now copy the contents of a code block with just one click. Uh, you can link to a specific class reference directly. I see in action right there. Have some improvements to the editor as well. So not, no file conversion necessary. We saw this earlier on. No GLTF intermediary needed anymore. You can use the UFBX importer if you wish. On top of that, you of course can still add the GLTF importer if you wish to use it. Uh, this one is also very nice. I covered this, how to do this with an add-on. You can now move the file system to the bottom of the screen. Uh, so let me just actually demonstrate that. So the file system, over here can now be moved to the bottom. So if you prefer to have more like Unity or Unreal Engine do, you can do that as well. Very nice feature change there, uh, I must add. Uh, on top of that, project manager layout and UX improvements there as well. Now there was looking like there was going to be an updater. It seems like that got removed from this release, which is a bit unfortunate, but the, the project management process just keeps getting nice improvements each release. Uh, GD script, uh, sort of GD extension, which is the extensions mechanism, the way of making add-ons or modulars for uh, Godot in general uh, has had general improvements there as well. You can register a runtime class with GD extension. Uh, 
register virtual methods, uh, custom documentation, so you are now able to add documentation to your GD extension code, akin to how the editor class already contains an offline copy of the class reference. Uh, and then we've got some improvements to GD script as well. So uh, slim down your export size, binary tokenization on export. New export option, you can reduce the size of your GD script exports dramatically or drastically. Uh, works by stripping your code back to bare essentials. In technical terms, this is called binary tokenization. The upside is this is also a bit of a form of obfuscation, so if you don't want people reading your code, uh, this would give you that ability as well. Uh, it's still decompilable. It's running code in the end, but it does make it harder to read and also makes it smaller. So again, if you want smaller binary, you have that option there as well. Is not operator was modified. So instead of writing, if not my node is node 3D, you can now simply write, if my node is not node 3D. Uh, we've got um, built-in functions are now usable as callables. Uh, export storage property annotations. So feature is for plugin developers amongst you using the new ex export storage annotation that allows you to store hidden values in a scene. A common use case for this would be storing add-on information in a node, preventing users from accidentally editing it in the inspector. Export custom property annotation, another plugin feature. You can now use export custom to uh, export a value suited to your needs. Uh, this means you can define pre and suffix custom hint and hint strings, usage flags, and more. Um, then GDScript auto completion fixes in there as well, and improvements to the way that circular dependencies are done. I've uh, got improvements to the navigation system, so splitting navigation meshes into chunks. So if you're working on a project with large game worlds, you may want to consider splitting your navigation meshes into more manageable chunks. Helps with memory allocation, therefore performance. Well, it's possible to manually slice your mes meshes before, making sure that your chunks align properly was non-trivial. Uh, non Alignment is necessary to ensure efficient, processing of runtime changes within the navigation map. And this released both navigation polygon 2D and navigation mesh 3D. Uh, resources receive new properties to define baking bounds and um, border offsets. Combined, these new properties can be used to bake navigation mesh chunks automatically with perfectly aligned edges to their neighbor chunks. Uh, we got uh, baking obstacles into navigation mesh functionality available there and simplified navigation paths. So the new path simplification office, uh, sorry, option on navigation agent nodes is now possible to remove less critical path points algorithmically. Uh, I've got some res uh, rendering improvements as well, pre-multiplied alpha blending in 3D shaders, the results of which you can see in action in this demo right here. And Composer Effects API lets users hook into the built-in Godot rendering pipeline to add custom rendering code. This is earlier on, but this is actually pretty major. Again, this is very early, but it's going to give you hooks into the, light, the, the rendering pipeline, gives you basically programmability of the pipeline without having to create your own special pipeline. Examples of what you could use this for, things like God rays, implement motion blur, and more. Uh, so we'll see this more and more in the future. And it's available now, though. Um, new rendering device architecture. So they refactor rendering device, specifically how it manages this device context in order to annihilate some bugs. As a bonus, let's just create rendering devices uh, whenever needed, which pave the way for finally baking light maps in the compatibility renderer. Um, so kind of behind the scenes stuff there. Uh, Depth-based fog is now possible. Uh, the acyclic rendering graph, so rendering device, the part of the rendering engine that powers the forward plus and mobile rendering backends, was improved by the introduction of directed acyclic render graph. Uh, newer APIs as Vulkan, Direct 3D12, and Metal give developers more access to the graphics card. The burden for making sure everything works correctly falls on the user. The acyclic graph permits the engine to reorder and optimize commands in order to minimize the API overhead of the graphics API while ensuring that everything happens in the right order. Without making any changes to your 3D scene, you should expect to see a frame rate improvement of 5 to 15 percent and more if you use GPU particles. So that's just basically a way of saying, you know, a 5 to 15 percent improvement in rendering performance, which is always nice. And the compatibility rendering back end got a lot of features here as well, including MSAA, Glow, uh, Lightmap, Global Illumination, and more. We do have the improvements to web. Again, we have that uh, single threaded export option mentioned earlier on. Also, web uh, audio. So by supporting audio samples on web platforms, we leverage their API to seamlessly uh, low to deliver seamless, low latency, and high quality audio. Addition was needed to combat persistent audio issues experienced when exporting for single threaded web builds. Uh, and Splash Screen is now available on the web as well. Got some improvements to the XR side of things as well. Uh, so 2D content renders less blurry. Uh, so this is done via the open XR composition layer support. Uh, that's adding your UI in that. So you can see the rendering uh, 
the, the difference in blur that you'll get between that. Standardized hand, body, and face tracking, a number of different performance improvements, Meta XR simulator support, Meta headset scene discovery and anchor support, and that's, that's the top level stuff. Of course, there's going to be a bunch more fixes in here as well, but we're coming up on 20 minutes in this video. So as you can see, uh, Godot 4.3 uh, definitely has a lot in it. Again, almost 3,500 commits from over 500 different people. A pretty major release. Uh, and again, it's just sort of across the board on the release, not like a huge new feature, just a bunch of improvements to what exists in there now. So let me know what you think of 4.3. What's your favorite new feature or anything in there that you're not loving? Let me know comments down below. Also, if you take your game over to 4.3 and compile it, are you getting that 5 to 15% free performance improvement if you're using you know direct 3d 12 metal or vulcan as your back end i'd love to know that as well comments down below i will talk to you all later goodbye